And today we're going to be talking about the humiliation of Jesus Christ. The humiliation of Jesus Christ. As we've been going through our topics in Beginner's Discipleship, the two books that I always recommended are Theological Studies by Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, and the second one is God's Answers to Man's Questions by Alvin Douglas. This one uh, I don't mention, but there were about a few Beginner's Discipleship's lessons that I done based on this book. It's called Bible Doctrines for Today. It is sold by uh, a Becca book, Pensacola Christian College. They adapted, I can tell, uh, their teachings from Alvin Douglas and Dr. Upman's Theological Studies book. Now, PCC don't like that and they don't want to admit it, but uh, it, it just turned out to be the case. <laughs> <coughs> Anyway, in all humility, let's talk about the humiliation of Jesus Christ. This is a very good study. The last time I taught this was probably 10 years ago, maybe. This was a very, very long time ago. So I look forward to covering this topic. I think all of you will get a huge blessing out of this. In other words, as we do know, Jesus Christ, he left his wonderful glory in heaven and became a man. So what he did was he humbled himself. He went through humiliation. He is the prime example and role model for us to follow. Let us observe some of these aspects in Jesus' life and apply them to ourselves so that we can walk in all humility as well. This is a study that's based off of Christology. Christology meaning the study of Christ. And you've heard from our beginner's discipleship a lot of things on Christology. We covered the deity of Christ. We covered the death of Christ. We covered the resurrection of Christ. We covered the ascension of Christ. We covered the intercessory work of Christ. We covered the humanity of Christ. And now we're going to talk about the humiliation of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2 and then we'll look at verses 5 through 8. The author asks, or actually not ask, he demands, let this mind be in you. In other words, keep this in your mind, that way we can follow his example. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. It's important to understand that Jesus Christ never ceased to be God. There are some false doctrines out there that think Jesus Christ, he lost his deity when he became a man, or that Jesus is not God at all. That is not true. Jesus is God. He never lost it when he became a man. But remember, he is fully God, and fully man. As he humbles himself, so this is an act of humility. Humble. He became a man. So he is fully God and he is fully man. Why is this an act of humility even though he's fully God? Because he took on another nature to fully become man. That's important to understand. So it's not contradictory. Sometimes it's really ridiculous. If you study church history, especially church fathers, there's just all these ridiculous debates that they went through. Whereas our Baptist ancestors uh, were out soul winning. That's what they were doing, street preaching. Whereas the church fathers and idiots who eventually became the Catholic Church, they were all debating about nitpicky, ridiculous doctrines. So they were all over the floor on, how does this work? How is Jesus, was Jesus half God, half man? Or did he, did he lose his deity when he became man? Or Jesus is not deity at all? It's just so ridiculous. But the simple answer is, he can be fully God and fully man. 
I mean, what's so hard about that? It's not hard to be that way, to become fully God and fully man. After all, he is God. He can fully become whoever he wants to. <laughs> Nothing's too hard for him. <clears throat> when we look at verse 7, he had no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, there's a humility, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We're going to talk about the humiliation which starts with his incarnation. His incarnation. So that's the first point here. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Notice this verse also proves that God never lost his deity. Jesus never lost his deity when he lived amongst humans. But when he lived amongst humans, that was considered to be the humane aspect. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. <clears throat> the Bible says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth the son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So when Mary gave birth to Jesus Christ, that was considered to be God with us with us, Jesus Christ. That's a blessing, is that we see from his incarnation, he took upon him the form of a servant. That's one to realize. So imagine if you gave up your job to take on a job of a butler or a servant. Think about that. Nobody wants that. In America, we want to strive for the job that we want that makes us look good, that benefit us. But not Jesus Christ. He took on the job to benefit others, to become a lowly servant. That's one thing you can observe from his incarnation. A second thing you can observe from his incarnation, he decided to dwell with sinners. He decided to live with sinners. There's a lot of things that you can observe from his act of humility, which is just amazing. So let's see from the standpoint of his incarnation here. We see from these acts of incarnation, he decided to take on the job of being a servant, and then he decided to live with sinners. Nobody wants to live with people that they do not like. And the evidence is you try to find a home where you don't have noisy neighbors. You try to live in a place where it's not really dangerous or lousy people. Everybody has that in their nature. Nobody likes a lousy roommate. Nobody wants to marry for life with someone that they do not like. But see this now. We are married to Jesus Christ and he wants, he is willing to live inside you. All right? I mean, imagine how much humiliation Jesus Christ had to go through for us. All right, third one. He was born in humble Bethlehem. Go to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. He was born in humble Bethlehem. What's the big deal about that? Oh, the big deal about that is, think about this. Do you know how much stressful it is for Jesus Christ to become a man? That's already sacrificial enough. If you don't think so, then why don't you go to heaven for two hours and then see yourself coming back down on this earth? You think you can do it? <laughs> Paul couldn't. That's why he was trying to get himself killed. You notice that? Imagine, that would be a, that would be a horrible thing. Like... You and I get to heaven. Oh, we made it here. And then God's like, okay, get back down on the earth. That'd be a horrible thing. <laughs> Man, I can't imagine that. But think about it. It's one thing to live on this earth and then go to heaven. But to be in heaven for all eternity and then to come down on this earth, that's already sacrificial enough. That's very stressful. 
But at the same time, now you have to add it a bit more. Hey, you're going to be born in a place where a lot of people won't recognize you. Jesus don't deserve that. He deserves to be recognized. Look, for all eternity, all he could ever experience was worship from people. Do you understand? Adoration, exaltation. That's his position. And to be recognized for his place to be up there, high and exalted. It was a place that Lucifer wanted to try to get up. But God was willing to stoop so low and to take on a position and a place that a lot of people would not even want to go. If you don't think so, then why are people moving out of California? They don't want to be here in particular cities. But imagine being at a city that you don't care about, that you don't like, but you decide to do that. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the Bible says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth hath been from of old, from everlasting. Not only that, go to Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, verse 16. It gets even lower. It gets even lower where he was born. Not just a humble city or a city that nobody really cares about, but also in a smelly stable, in a smelly stable. You know what that meant? That meant that your birthplace and my birthplace was far better than Jesus Christ. I mean, we were born in a comfortable bed. We were born with warmth and uh, a lot of medical help or Maybe some of you, uh, some people were done from natural birth, etc. But the point is, is that we had a cozy, loving environment. But Jesus Christ was born in a cold and also in a very smelly, disgusting environment. Let's look at Luke chapter 2 and verse 16. <clears throat> and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. From what we see nowadays is that the manger is pictured as something pretty and nice, but, I mean, if you go inside a barn, it's not that nice as you think, right? I don't know if some of you have been to a barn or in a place where there's a whole bunch of animals colliding together with their smell and body odor filling up the place. With dung all over. You ever thought about that? Matthew chapter 13. Go to Matthew chapter 13. So he was born in a smelly stable. How much lower can he get? Yet Jesus Christ was willing to do all of that for you. He loved you that much. His birthplace was humble. He, his birthplace was also in a very low-down place that nobody wants to go, a smelly stable. We will now observe not only his uh, incarnation, but his early life. His early life. His humility did not stop right there. His humility continued. In his early life, he was the son of poor Jewish parents. That's the first thing you want to realize. He was born as the son of poor Jewish parents. For God Almighty himself, it would be an act of humility to be born a king on this earth. Do you understand? It would already be a humble act for Jesus Christ to stoop himself so low to become a human king on this earth. Do you understand that? That would already be humble enough. It's like being demoted. Do you understand? He was demoted from 
being a ruler in heaven to a ruler on earth. Imagine if that were the case. That would be considered a demotion. That's like a vice president of a company becoming a manager of a team. That's a demotion. That's a humiliation. That ain't an honor. But it would be even more humiliating that you are in a position that has zero respectability whatsoever. <laughs> You're not even a supervisor. You're not even a manager. You're not even a regular employer. You're just considered to be that janitor, right? That nobody pays attention to. You're considered to be that guy who takes out the trash or something. Basically, that's the position that Jesus Christ was raised under that kind of a family. He was born, uh, he was raised amongst a poor family. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 55, verse 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? You notice how people say that? In other words, they're saying that Jesus Christ, he's not that special. I mean, isn't he the carpenter's son? You notice the wording of that? That shows that his position was not really well esteemed. It was very looked down upon. Let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Jesus Christ was in a much more humiliating position than me. I mean, being a minister is not really uh, looked well. It's not well esteemed. But at least I have diplomas on my back, right? Because I got diplomas in my back. I have a family background where I can explain to lost people about uh, my, high, my higher education and I'm able to use that to witness to them or get them to recognize what I'm saying. But see, Jesus Christ had the total disadvantage of having none of that for his background. And yet he preached the word of God, not caring what people thought about him. How about you? See, you don't need degrees in your background. You don't need degrees, higher ed, or something prestigious, or something to be recognized, to have authority in preaching the word of God. Why? Because you have a role model who went through worse than you, and that's Jesus Christ. He was a carpenter's son. Do you understand? What a great role model. I hope that what you'll get out of this lesson is that you'll do something more for Jesus Christ and that all your excuses will become nothing because Jesus Christ went through worse than you and I. I hope that's what you'll get out of this lesson. We're going to look at John chapter 1 and verse 46. A second thing is that he was raised in Nazareth. He was raised in Nazareth. You might say, why is that something to consider as an act of humiliation? Because Nazareth was not viewed as a favorable light. So not only was he born in a humble, low-down city, but also when he moved out of that city, he continued to maintain the lowly status of being raised in a low-down city. Look at John chapter 1 and verse 46. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, come and see. You notice that there? Me, I can quite often say that I'm from the Bay Area or from Berkeley or from some of these cities. And then when I word it that way, it's as if people kind of know where I'm from or my background or they give me some recognition. But if I give you some, uh, excuse me for saying this, some hillbilly city out in the Midwest that nobody gives a flip about, nobody knows about, then it's like I lose all my status or recognition. I don't know if you notice that, but sometimes you can tell that about people. Uh, depending on what city they come from, then they get some kind of recognition or you give them some recognition, which is kind of weird. So, but that is the case. But Jesus Christ had none of that. And when people asked him, where'd you come from? I came from Nazareth. And then why would people... Listen to Jesus then. <laughs> Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Luke chapter 2 and verse 51. 
Luke chapter 2, verse 51. You know what's more humiliating? I'll tell you what's more humiliating. He had to be in subjection to humans. Do you understand? <laughs> he is God. He does not have to subject himself to human beings, but he was willing to be in subjection to humans. Subjected to a lowly place, but not only that, subjected to sinners, to humans. That's just something there. That's our God. Let's see. Let's move this to the side. <laughs> Raised in a hood. <laughs> Subject to humans. Luke chapter 2, and then we'll look at verse 51. It was under Mary and Joseph. The Bible says, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Well, what's so humiliating about that? Subject yourself to somebody lower than you. You try that, huh? <laughs> Here's a, here's a good example, all right? Uh, when you're both in a fight, husbands, you got the authority, right? The wife is supposed to submit herself to you, right? Imagine, husband, that with your power and authority that you have every right to, you subject yourself and hold your tongue and subject to the wife after that. <laughs> Especially in the middle of a fight. That ain't happening, right? So... That's, you got to understand this, that's the feeling Jesus had to go through. Can you imagine every time in his mind he could critique his parents when his parents tell him to do something? You know why it's hard for us to subject to even authorities in our life? Not just people lower than us, well, that'll never happen, but to people we're supposed to subject to, authorities in our life, because of that critical mind that we have where we think we're better on something, or that person's wrong about something. Don't you think Jesus Christ could have done that every time with Mary and Joseph? You getting under conviction? Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. So, kids, know this. You got to subject yourself to the parents, no matter how much you think that they're wrong. Wife, you got to subject to the husband no matter how much you think that he's wrong. And members, you got to subject yourself to the minister no matter how much you think that he's wrong. And those who are in authority, you can't just keep using your authority. You got to do what Jesus did, where you are willing to put aside your authority and subject to someone lower than you. So pastors, they do subject to members at times. Husbands, subject to the wife at times. And sometimes parents might have to subject to the kids. Now, I know that sounds very controversial, but it is very true because I got scripture for it. The scripture verse is simply the book of Ephesians. The filling power of the Spirit is likewise make sure you subject yourself, submit to one another. We're all serving each other. No one is higher than the other. If you think... <clears throat> So I hope that's convicting people because there are so many people out there who are not subjecting. And you have a billion excuses. Everyone has a billion excuses not to subject. But Jesus Christ had more legitimate reason not to subject. But if he can subject, then you and I can certainly subject. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. He suffered hunger and thirst. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Uh, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward unhungered. Now look, if you look at verse 3, the tempter came and said, Hey, you're hungry? Just turn these stones into bread. But verse 4, Jesus Christ was willing to set aside set aside his act of power that he had every right to do, 
where he could have turned those stones into bread and fed himself and said, no, I choose to put aside, listen, <clears throat> my own needs to go through this act of humility because it's needful. Why is this needful? It was needful for preparation of the ministry, preparation of a greater work for God. You know, you have to sacrifice some needs there. I didn't say desire. Did you hear what I said? We all whine about sacrificing the things that I want or the things that I desire for the work of God. Why do I? Hey, what about sacrificing needs? You know what the need is? You need to eat, you need to drink, or you're going to die. But Jesus Christ put that aside for a greater work and a higher calling of God. So it's tough for you when family forsake you, criticize you, you lose things in life for a greater calling, for a greater work of God. Know this, one man beat you to it. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you have a huge sacrifice that you put aside for the greater work of God, uh, Jesus Christ beat you to it, where he was suffering hunger and thirst. That's, you know what, that, that is an unbearable pain, is when you're hungry and when you're thirsty. You know that? It's such a torturous feeling. If you think that your emotion, your mental state, your physical state is very torturous or unbearable, uh, starve yourself, see what happens. <laughs> Go without drinking, see what happens. Here, let's look at Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4. And Jesus Christ had every temptation to fulfill his need, but he never went for it. So guess what, Christian? You have every temptation <clears throat> to cling on to your desire or your need rather than sacrificing it on the altar for the greater work of God. You have every temptation to do it, but don't do it. Why? Because Jesus Christ already showed you the example. Hey, I didn't do it, so you need to not do it too. All right, Hebrews chapter 4. And then uh, notice in verse 15. The Bible says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Notice right here that Jesus Christ, his humiliation continued on, not only in his early life, but also in the ministry, in his early ministry. We now come to a point uh, where Jesus Christ has grown up and he is, uh, oh, excuse me, he is now doing the work of the Lord, ministry. Any missionary or pastor that gets discouraged in the ministry, let them look unto Jesus as their example before they think that they've sacrificed so much or go through so much. Let them look unto Jesus' ministry, not their own ministry. Don't look at your own ministry. You get discouraged. Look at Jesus' ministry and get encouraged and get inspired and follow his example. We covered sacrificing needs and then we're now covering he went through all sorts of temptation as we did. He went through it all temptation, the struggle of sin, and things that come up in the flesh. He had to set those things aside. He had to gain victoriously against it. Look at John chapter 1, verse 11. John chapter 1, verse 11. If you don't think that Jesus Christ <clears throat> went through all points of temptation, the scripture says otherwise. Let me ask you this question. Don't you think that 40 days, that was a huge chance for the devil to pull out anything he could on Jesus Christ? You ever thought about that? Aren't you glad the devil didn't pull out the works on you in temptation? 
So if you think that your temptation is very unique, that your sin is just too great, that it's so hard to conquer, uh, the devil didn't pull out all the works on you, but he did it on Jesus. Jesus Christ went through far greater temptation than you and I went through. Let's go to John chapter 1 and verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Well, the humiliation continues because he was rejected by his own people. <laughs> uh, you ever felt rejected? Preacher, missionary? Here you are ministering to them, but then they reject you. Members talk bad about you, gossip about you. Uh, there's church splits. They take away your sheep. They underappreciate you. The world hates you. Your family is looking down upon you. Both minister and Bible-believing Christians get rejected by the people that they love. And think about this. You're sacrificing for them. You're giving up yourself for them. Here are parents giving up themselves for their children, but the children underappreciate them, still complain about them. We live in such an ungrateful generation nowadays. We live in a, such a spoiled, rotten generation nowadays. And here you are sacrificing, working so hard for the people you love, and they reject you. Yeah, Jesus understands that feeling, not just you. It ain't all about you. It ain't all about you. Jesus Christ already beat you to it. 2,000 years ago. <laughs> You're not a new case. Everyone, when they go through some pain in their lives, they always think that they're a new case. You notice that? That they're always unique. That they're always so special and that it's so hard. And no matter what the scriptures say, that my God shall supply all your needs, all things work together for good, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, and my grace is sufficient for thee. We always think that our case is unique to the Scripture. We always think that the Scripture may apply to other people, but not to me in this feeling that I'm feeling right now. Not to me in this case that I'm going through. We always think we're so special. You know, I, we're, we're not humiliated enough. We're too much filled with pride. That is our human nature. If you are so humble, you would realize that the fe negative feelings that you're going through should be actually a lot worse. If God really gave you what you deserved. Think about that. That will make you more grateful. What will make you more grateful is to think about what you really deserved, no matter how bad your life is. So John 1.11, it mentions again, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. If there's one thing that your minister needs more than money is he needs housing, right? <laughs> needs a place. That way he can keep preaching. But Jesus Christ was without suitable housing. He was without suitable housing housing yet he kept ministering well i can't minister for the lord why because i don't even have a place to live i'm about to be kicked out i can't cover the rent jesus christ had no house yet he still preached yet he still ministered yet he still discipled wow. preacher you have no excuse jesus still beat you to it You just don't want to go through that humiliating point in your life. And that's why the author keeps insisting, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. But that's not in our mind. In our mind, we want to be exalted, elevated, comforted. In our mind, we do not have humiliation. I'd like to ask you this question. When was the last time in your mind it was humiliation? When was that the last time in your mind? Or is it 
in your mind, I want coffee. And I should get coffee. Why? Because everybody has it. So I deserve a good coffee. And if you don't get a good coffee, you complain about it. It's too cold. It's not the right taste. Why? Because for some weird reason, I deserve a good coffee. Because I bought it with my own money. It, you, you, it's always a I deserve mentality. You notice that? Yeah, amen. Good. I got one amen here. All right, at least one brother is getting under conviction here. But everyone should be under conviction here. That is in our minds all the time. Is that I deserve mentality. That's in our mind. Let's be honest, 24-7. I feel like such a hypocrite teaching the word of God to you right now. Because even though I'm saying all this, in my mind, it's ingrained. It's innate with no humiliation as I preach to you the word of God. Do you understand? That's what we're built in with this wicked mechanism in our minds. We're built in with, I deserve it, 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 I deserve it. But if you keep thinking in your mind, I don't deserve this, I don't deserve this, then don't you think your joy would be tenfold increased when you come to this church? Your joy will remain when you go through suffering. Mind, let this mind be in you. What? Humiliation. That I don't deserve this. You want joy of the Lord? Quite often what always interferes with joy is you. So you got to get you out of the way. You got to kill yourself. The best way to kill yourself is humiliation. Humiliation is where you can die to self. Look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 20. Matthew chapter 8, verse 20. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. <laughs> Did you get this right here? Did you? I don't know if people saw that right there. Okay. He was not only without suitable housing, Jesus debased himself lower than the animals. That's how much he, he humiliated himself. He debased himself lower than the animals. That's my Lord and my God. I think he deserves to be praised and worshipped. If, if a person like that went through like that for me, I mean, that is a person worth giving all my life for. All right. Man, what a great God. Let's uh, look at Luke chapter 11, verse 15. Luke chapter 11, verse 15. But his humiliation becomes even worse. Humiliation just becomes even worse. Look at the book of Luke chapter 11, and we'll look at verse 15. Luke chapter 11, and we'll look at verse 15. He was blasphemed. He was blasphemed. One thing uh, people make fun of you, criticize you, but it's another thing where they criticize you to the point where it really hits on your touchy spots. You know what the sin of blasphemy is? The sin of blasphemy is where you get stoned to death. Or you get stoned to death. You know what blasphemy is? Blasphemy, I mean, it's one thing to criticize Christians, but it's another thing where you see these disgraceful, stupid, wicked, demon-possessed uh, incidents where atheists are just uh, urinating on, uh, on crosses or tearing up Bibles and then saying, F Jesus Christ, not just only taking his name in vain. That is just sent from the pits of hell no one can stand that. That is just excruciating. That is just really excruciating. But if you say the truth that Muhammad was a pervert, then what happens is the whole world is set on fire because they feel like it's like the sin of blasphemy. <laughs> you notice that there? Uh, for telling the truth. But for this one, this is disgraceful, this is dishonorable, this is a big no-no. 
This is something that should get people deeply offended. But yet Jesus Christ took that, was willing to stomach that for them. Can you imagine how many times Jesus Christ not only has to hear people criticizing him, but blaspheming him? Luke chapter 11 and verse 15. But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others tempting him sought of him a sign from heaven. You notice what they did? They were working on Jesus. It's kind of like street preaching, right? How people try to work on you. They try to offend you. And then one of the biggest ways they could do it is to just blaspheme. But that didn't get on Jesus Christ, he just continued to preach and focus on, these are the people that I'm going to die for and save from hell. That's something, right? All right, look at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 6. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 6. He was made lower than the angels. He was made lower than the angels. Jesus Christ had all the power, all the authority, and he's willing to be lower in power than the angels. Now think about this. These are the people who ministered to him. These are the people who sang praises to him. These are the people who worshipped him. And Jesus Christ was willing to be lower than them. Lower than them. That's an act of humiliation that he was willing to undergo. Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll look at verses 6 through 8. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him, thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the work of thy hands. It's talking about Jesus Christ becoming that man and becoming lower than the angels. Let's look at Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Now, this one is going to be, uh, I think, of a big blessing. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures on this one. Go to Luke chapter 3. All right, we're going to go through a timeline here. Now, this is unfathomable what I just wrote, right? Angels being higher than Jesus Christ, that's just something. I tremble when I think about it or even when I write it that way. But that's what Jesus Christ had to do to save me from hell. He did that out of pure love for me. Now, we're going to cover the interesting part. The interesting thing, as we come to number seven, I'm not going to write number seven. It's just going to be more of a chart here. The humiliation of Jesus Christ intensified. It grew uh, during the week of the crucifixion. The humiliation of Jesus Christ intensified uh, during the week of his crucifixion. So let's see the act of humility that he went through as the timeline increased. Uh, this is a little curved. I'm sorry about that. Let's see. Try to draw a straight line here. Oh, yeah. All right. That's okay. <laughs> Age 30 age 31, age 32, and age 33, okay? We're going to go through age 30, age 31, and age 32, and age 33. These were the years that Jesus Christ went through in his ministry. And we're going to see an intensity of his humiliation. The first thing that uh, we're going to look at is Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. All right? 
Matthew chapter 3, and then we'll look at verse 1. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. When he reached the age of 30, notice what he undergone. It was something so deep in an act of humility that John the Baptist wasn't able to do it. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Now look what happens over here in verse 11, 11. John the Baptist says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. So John the Baptist is not even worthy to uh, tie the shoe latchet of Jesus Christ's shoes. And yet, notice that Jesus Christ was willing to debase himself more than John the Baptist. If you look at verse 14, 14, but John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto it, Suffer it to be so now. Jesus Christ yet told John the Baptist, Yeah, I'm willing to debase myself lower than you, so just put up with it. So he put that act of humility. Then it increased at chapter 4 and verse 1, which we looked at. At chapter 4, verse 1, he was tempted by the devil he was tempted by the devil go to john chapter 1 verse 9 john chapter 1 and we'll look at verse 9 the bible says that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world so this is Jesus Christ when he's on this earth. And then verse 15, same case, John the Baptist. And you do remember that he humbled himself at that time. And then verse 46, his humiliation was he was looked down upon for, from the place that he was raised. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Then uh, look at chapter 2. And in chapter 2, he was able to do his first miracle. But you'll notice right here that Jesus Christ, he was humble that when you look at verse 3, verse 3, and they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Now, I know the meaning over here when Jesus said, it's not mine hour yet, but besides that explanation, some possibility to think about is that the mother, maybe, just maybe, she realized the power with Jesus Christ, and she wanted her son to manifest the power and to help them with this predicament, but Jesus Christ wanted to remain in humility that he didn't want to show off his miracle, which is why in verse 11, that was the beginning of his miracle. That was the beginning of his miracle in verse 11. The timeline of this was in verse 12, verse 12, which is at the Passover, verse 12 and verse 13, verse 12 and verse 13. That is the first Passover that occurred. And we've seen his acts of humiliation displayed from the baptism, from the first miracle, and from the place that he was raised, Nazareth. Continue to increase when we go to John chapter 2, verse 13 through chapter 4 and verse 54, chapter 2 and verse 13, and through chapter 4, 54. That was at the age of 31, and we reached the second Passover, which is John chapter 5, verse 1. 
Okay, so look at these timelines here. I'm marking these Passover so that we can mark his uh, life in sequence, okay? That's the purpose. As we look at his life in sequence, you can notice the humiliation gradually increases. If we look at chapter 2 and verse 13, we see right here from the first Passover, we're now heading toward uh, the second Passover. If we look at uh, verse 23, verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And look at this, need it not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Did you see that right there? In spite of his acts of accomplishments, which is his exaltation moment, he never lost his humility. He says, people don't need to say anything about me. Ain't that something? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. But now, nowadays, a lot of Bible believers, they just try to toot the horn or they want attention, don't they? But they're not following Jesus Christ's example. Chapter 3, it continues on the story where Nicodemus, he encounters uh, Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Jesus gets recognized. If you look at verse 2, Nicodemus would refer to him as rabbi and say that, man, you're a teacher come from God. No one can do all this except it be from you. But then if you keep reading down at verse 10, verse 10, Jesus actually recognizes Nicodemus to be the master of Israel with his position. You will also notice that in verse 13, all the way through uh, 19, Jesus talks about himself go, going through humiliation, not tooting his horn on his miracles or his greatness. He continues with his humiliation. In spite of John the Baptist, when we look at chapter 3 and verse 30, do you see that there? Chapter 3 and verse 30, John the Baptist said about Jesus, he must increase but I must decrease. So Jesus Christ is getting exalted. He is getting attention. But Jesus Christ emphasized so much on staying humble. Staying humble. When the Lord exalts you, will you stay humble? Will you not garner attention? That's really good. That's really good preaching there. Then we look at uh, chapter 4. Chapter 4. Notice that Jesus never forgot his position. If you look at uh, verse 7, There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Look at verse 9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Jesus Christ continued his act of humiliation where he went for the people that no one would want to minister to. It's one thing to minister to people, but what about people you don't like? People that other, the public won't have anything to do with. When's the last time you've done something like that? Jesus Christ maintained that act of humiliation. That's something. He never lost his humility. Well, uh, I, I can go on and on, but I just don't have time. But if you look at chapter 4, and then uh, chapter 5, uh, chapter 4, verse 54, we reach the time where we're reaching the second Passover at chapter 5 and verse 1. Chapter 5, verse 1. But you see that, in, that humiliation, it kept increasing. You know why this was an increase? Because in spite of his exaltation, he put himself low. He put himself low. His act of humility is incredibly amazing. Then we come to age 32. And in age 32, we come now from the second Passover, and we're reaching the third Passover. Passover. 
As we undergo the third Passover, it would be covered at Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, all the way through chapter 14, verse 12. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, through Matthew chapter 14, verse 12. Uh, I won't have time to uh, go through that, but I would encourage you to look at that at your spare time and then see and observe Jesus Christ's humiliation. What am I trying to tell you? Let this mind be in you. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's why I look through that verse. And let this mind be in you as you read those verses. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant. All right, then we come across age 33. And in age 33, it covers the timeline of Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, to chapter 20 and verse 34. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, to Matthew chapter 20 and verse 34. And then the last one, here we go, we come to the fourth. Let's squeeze this in here, that way y'all can see The fourth Passover, which is John chapter 11, verse 55. John chapter 11, verse 55. So it goes from Matthew 14, 13 through chapter 20, verse 34, when we undergo this. See that? This, this gap here, uh, this, uh, this box here. <laughs> this will be John chapter 11, verse... 55, the final Passover. Let's look at Matthew chapter, uh, well, let's look at John chapter 11. Let's look at John chapter 11. And then verse 55. We come to the end of that portion of the Passover and entering the final one. Uh, John chapter 11, verse 55, And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. And many went out of the country, uh, went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. And we look at chapter, uh, when we enter into this final Passover, you'll notice that at chapter 12 begins his crucifixion. Chapter 13, we enter to the part where he washes the disciples' feet. You'll also notice at chapter 11 and verse 35, chapter 11, verse 35, Jesus wept over a man. Do you understand what's going on over here? Jesus knew that he could raise him from the dead. Why would he have to cry? Why would he have to cry? Because other people were weeping. Other people were in grief. And God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all the prestige, would break his prestigious look with tears in his eyes over a man that he knew he would raise from the dead real soon. He never lost that softness, that, humili that humiliation, that humility. All right, notice that uh, it increased and intensified during the week of the crucifixion. So now, look at this. This is amazing. We won't have time to go through these verses, but write them down. Now, it re oh, excuse me. Ugh, come on, come on, come on. Now we reach the climax here of his humility. He rode on a borrowed donkey. He rode on a borrowed donkey. That's Zechariah, uh, that's Zechariah 9.9. 9. Zechariah 9.9. 9. Not even a horse. <laughs> you notice how people always like to get nice cars? Even people who don't have much money, they ride nice vehicles. You notice that, how they do that? Some people actually live in broke down homes, but they got fancy cars. But Jesus Christ rode on a borrowed donkey. 
And the verse says, lowly, riding upon an ass. That's what it says. He borrowed an upper room during the Passover. He had to borrow a room. He was betrayed for a slave's price. Betrayed for a slave's price. Let's continue on with this chart. Betrayed for a slave's price. He was tortured unmercifully. Tortured unmercifully. One thing to be killed and get it over with, another thing to be tortured. Another thing to be tortured, but to be tortured without any sense of compassion. Tortured unmercifully. And then his followers denied him. Oh, that's horror. That's sad. His own followers denied him. Imagine as you're undergoing torture that the people who are supposed to follow you, they're not there for you when you're being tortured. They're not there to support you. That's something very hurtful. But even more so is how God the Father abandoned his son, right? That was probably the, the ultimate thing that hurt is the abandonment of God the Father. So notice how his humiliation increased. Let this mind be in you, <laughs> which was also in Christ Jesus. Ain't that a trip? Ain't that a journey? And we go further back to the very beginning, not just his ministry, not just his early life, all the way to the beginning of the incarnation, from beginning to end, an act of humility. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. One more verse, we'll call it a day. All right, just write down uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 57 through 50, 61, Matthew chapter 27, verse 57 through 61, and then your other one to be Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. The verse will be, let's see right here, 9. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. A borrowed tomb. Not only that, it was a tomb, he was he made his grave with the wicked, the Bible says. He made his grave with the wicked. He decided to be buried with sinners. His humiliation continued. That is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you, please. Let this mind be in you. Father God, thank you so much for today's lesson. I pray that we'll apply it. I pray that we'll live it. I pray that in our very own minds we'll be innate with humiliation and not with give me, not with I deserve something better, not with pride. Father God, it's so difficult for us because we're just flesh and we're just weak. Will you please help us, Father, to always have soft hearts, soft hearts where we don't think we're better than other people, where we're willing to put ourselves lower than other people. And even when we have legitimate excuses to do what we want to do or when we're right, or we should enact our own legitimate rights and legitimate authorities, I pray that we'll debase ourselves, we'll lower ourselves instead. Follow your example. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.